Nice. Hmm. I hope that intro photo is isn't too mm. too cheesy. It's just it's one of my favorite photos of of a time of Yellowstone. So. I, I love the photo. Thank you so much, Forrest. I love my virtual background today. <laughs> so do I. So do I, Forrest. It's uh, it's looking yeah. good. Something new. <laughs> It's the uh, it's the back it's the new back porch view, so it's not it's not not too terrible. It's nice. Absolutely. Fantastic. <laughs> Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. We hope you're keeping well. Keith Valentine and myself, Nikki Stewart from Rock Jumper Birding Tours, are thrilled to be co-hosting another Rock Jumper virtual adventure, and we wish you all a very warm welcome. As um, vac vaccination efforts across the globe ramp up, uh, we are seeing a number of tours taking place to international destinations, obviously following strict COVID-19 health and safety protocols. Destinations such as Costa Rica, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Namibia, Colombia, Mongolia, Ecuador, Panama, Ghana, and the US. Keith, I hope I mentioned all of them to name a few <laughs> that we here at Rock Jumper have toured or will be touring in the next few months. However, we know many of you living in the US are keen to travel, but perhaps not yet ready to take that international trip just yet. Or you live outside of the US and keen to take a trip in. Then today, let us virtually whisk you away to Yellowstone, one of USA's most famous national parks. Home to the specials like black rosy finch, chestnut colored longspur, mountain plover, dusky grouse, not to mention the grizzly bear, gray wolf, American bison, and mountain goat. Leading us today in our rock, is our rock jumper veteran birding tour leader, Forrest Rowland, who resides nearby to Yellowstone National Park and is an expert in the area. Forrest has dedicated his career and life to guide birding, participating in numerous scientific ex excursions, initiatives, and conservation boards. Welcome, Forrest. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vicky. Thanks for having me again, guys. It's nice to nice to be back and and have another another chance to uh to share one of the one of the amazing places that you know I get to get to go regularly. In this case, um, you know, unlike Colombia and some of the other places where I've spent a, a lot of time, actually I, I live here. I've been a resident in the area for um, the past 11, 12 years, <clears throat> and uh, just recently moved even closer to Yellowstone. From where I was living now about a about a 40 minute drive away from the north entrance so so very exciting um, and very excited to talk to to all of you that have joined us today thanks for coming um, about uh, about where I, I get to call home which is uh, which is pretty cool so uh, so from wherever you're 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 joining us here um, we hope you get the chance to to enjoy Yellowstone National Park which truly is one of one of North America's Many treasures, but it but it really is is iconic. So um, so yeah, I'll just uh, kind of kick it off, and um, I think you can all see my screen here. It started with a, a photo of me a couple years ago um, at Yellowstone National Park on one of the one of the trips I was leading. So so yeah, I think some of you might be very familiar with Yellowstone. Um, some of the sights and sounds and smells, maybe you've been there before, but a lot of you probably haven't. And I, I don't really know what comes to mind uh, for everyone when they think of Yellowstone, but I kind of picture something like this. Um, vast landscape, very lush, uh, bison, a lot of big charismatic megafauna, and, uh, and sort of a sense of, of true wilderness as, you know, there's such a, a vast area of wilderness within Yellowstone and the surrounding areas um, where we live. So one of the things that people probably think of right off the top of their head, if you're a wildlife enthusiast with mo most rock jumper folks and, uh, and people joining us today would be, is, uh, is the chance to glimpse a gray wolf. Uh, gray wolves being reintroduced 
uh, several years ago. I'll give a little bit of background on that later in the presentation. Any trip to Yellowstone, uh, you really hope to see a gray wolf and, of course, a brown or grizzly bear. Um, grizzly bears are just, uh, just pretty amazing iconic creatures for, for North American wilderness. And one of the other things you might see pretty early on are some sparring pronghorn antelope, uh, very common in the open areas to Yellowstone. And of course, the, uh, the bison that we looked at a little bit earlier. This is one of my favorite of the charismatic megafauna in, uh, in Yellowstone, and we get to see a lot of those. So Yellowstone was, was founded. Um, it was the world's first national park, as some of you might know. And uh, it has one of my very favorite quotes uh, on top of the main entrance to Yellowstone. And that's at the Roosevelt Arch you see there. The park was established in 1872 with the quote, for the benefit enjoyment of the people by President Theodore Roosevelt. And it's part of the Nez Perce Historic Trail. So not, not you know, everyone thinks of it as being uh, having a, a ton of Native American um, or archaeological benefit and culture, but, but it did. As many as 26 Native tribes spent time in and around Yellowstone uh, National Park. What a lot of people think of when they think of Yellowstone, of course, is the volcano. It's this vast expanse, this wonderful landscape covered in scenes like this, amazing fumaroles and steam coming out of the landscape. Um, incredible formations, geological formations made by the volcanoes, um, well, made by the, the volcanic activity within Yellowstone National Park. This being the mammoth terraces, this is the, the closest geothermal feature to, to where I live when we come in from the north part of the park in Gardner. And the iconic one, the Grand Prismatic. This is one of the more iconic, colorful, and exceptional geothermal features in Yellowstone National Park, which is a little bit closer towards the Madison Valley. So where is the Yellowstone and the Yellowstone uh, volcano located? For those of you who are not from North America, it might not be entirely familiar with exactly where we are. Um, the volcano itself is located almost entirely in the state of Wyoming. Uh, the park has five different entrances coming in from the, uh, well, all four directions, but coming in from the states of Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. Uh, the caldera of the volcano itself proper is about 30 by 45 miles in, uh, in square area. So it's it's a huge, huge, huge volcano. Uh, the last eruption of which uh, formed that, that massive crater was 640,000 years ago. So still very active today, but, but thankfully not as active as it once was. Um, but yeah, one of, the, one of the neat things about coming to Yellowstone, of course, is uh, the geothermal features and actually being inside uh, the caldera of a volcano for much of the time you're, you're in the park. Uh, the accesses that we have here to Yellowstone, kind of through in this map so you can see from the north, that's where we come in from, is Gardner in Livingston, Montana. And then in the northeast, towards the right of the screen, that's where our route sort of exits out towards Cook City, the Beartooth Plateau, and Red Lodge, ultimately. There's a west entrance into Yellowstone through the Madison Valley, an east entrance via Cody, which is also spectacular, going over the Sylvan Pass and a south entrance, which is commonly used to get to and from Yellowstone from Jackson, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, uh, Grand Tetons National Park. So the size of the National Park is one of the most amazing features about it. Um, the, uh, if you look here on the left, it's uh, almost 3,500 square miles worth of area. So, so huge. Um, for those, again, of you from the, from the U.S., that's the size of the states of Delaware and Rhode Island combined. So um, yeah, a national park as big as two states. It's got 466 miles of road, which is where most people that visit the park spend their time. It's a good way to cruise through the park and see the charismatic megafauna, get to the various geothermal features that, that people wanna see. Um, but it also has over a thousand miles of trails inside. Um, backcountry and what we call near country, which could be boardwalks and other really nice self-guided interpretive trails. 
Uh, but yeah, there are months and months of trails to be explored in Yellowstone um, on top of the easier access stuff. Visitation in Yellowstone is, uh, <laughs> is high. So this year, I think we're, we're expected to be back up over the 4 million mark where the visitation was hanging for the last few years before um, the pandemic um, became, became an issue. It is the most visited national park in North America, one of the most visited national parks in the world. Um, yeah, so it's also one of the reasons why we like to spend a little bit of time in what we call the, the Greater Yellowstone Eco Region, because the park can, at times, get a little busy. And so what, uh, what I'm going to take everybody through now is sort of a, a run of my favorite route through the area, which allows you to see all of the ecosystems in what we call the Greater Yellowstone Eco Region. And it includes a vast myriad of ecosystems, not just kind of the typical high mountain meadows or, or vast forests that, uh, that we typically associate with Yellowstone. It also includes some, uh, some pretty neat stuff in the prairies and wetlands and so forth. So one of the most important habitats that you can get to is uh, the mixed grass prairies, what we call mixed grass prairies. We have both short and tall grass prairies here uh, in Montana. And we have all the species, the species associated with, with those, uh, both of those habitats. Um, and there's some pretty amazing access to those. Uh, and this is one of the more common and wonderful animals you'll see on the prairies. That's the pronghorn or pronghorn antelope. It's one of the few animals that was actually evolved to evade an African predator when all the continents were combined. The pronghorn evolved to evade an ancient uh, version of cheetah, hence why it's the fastest North American land mammal. Um, other mammals you see in the habitat, plenty of Richardson's ground squirrel running around, which are pretty cute to enjoy. And I think a, a real big crowd pleaser, one of the most interesting mammals, very seldom seen in fact, is the American badger. Uh, they're very widespread and they enjoy a number of habitat types. But of course, they're a little bit easier to see out in the open habitats being really low to the ground. And if you look in this photo, which is a, a great photo by Kate Oxman, you can see the, uh, you can see the big claws on the, on the adult used for burrowing and, and digging. And uh, they do live in burrows and, uh, and defend them fiercely as well. So, so you'll see there's uh, not often that much going around uh, a badger den. One of the most important bird species that we have in the prairies nearby is the Baird Sparrow. So here's one singing Got this last year. We're spending some time in the prairies to get some material, including footage of some of these scarcer species. Um, there are several threatened species of birds in the prairies, uh, with the prairie actually being the most imperiled habitat in the region due to expanding needs for agriculture and, and other, other practices. Um, so aside from the Baird Sparrow, which is thankfully really common along the routes uh, that we choose to visit in the prairies, are uh, our mountain plover and Sprague's pipit. Here's a little shot of a mountain plover. I decided to throw in the obligatory cow patty because honestly, if you're going to see a mountain plover in Montana, there's going to be cow patties close by. Um, it's actually a really interesting um, relationship between what would have been roving bison herds and bovid herds grazing the grass down to the level that the mountain plovers require um, to appropriately forage and, and what their preferred nest habitat is, which is incredibly short grass prairie. And so, uh, so yeah, what the, the bison used to provide, um, a lot of times now it's just in the form of uh, sedentary cattle, but of course that has its, that has its, its tricky parts as well in terms of conservation, nesting, longevity. Uh, a really a special, a special bird. Um, a lot of times we can get pretty close to. I've got my, my Tacoma in the back of this shot here. But we were, we were watching this mountain plover pair um, that's been nesting at the site where we found them uh, about six years ago. And um, yeah, and they just kind of come right up to you a little bit sometimes. But there are unfortunately fewer than 1,200 individuals um, left in Montana, decreasing habitat and um, in a little bit of, of trouble with nest success. Um, so there has been an overall population decrease. There are some people working on why that may be. 
Um, but yeah, luckily enough, we have some some really pretty stable nesting grounds from Adam Clover where we are. And this is a spectacular little bird that not many people get to see very well. I think most often they're seen on their wintering grounds in small flocks and big pastures near golf courses and such. Um, but this is the uh, the Sprague's pipit. And this pipit spends a lot of time um, up in the air in the breeding season here, which is really spectacular. So what they'll do is they'll fly up above the prairies and just make these big spiraling circles, belting out their sound, sometimes maintaining that singing flight for an hour. Um, and so to, uh, to obtain these photos, sort of figured out where the territory base was for this individual that was singing and just waited for him to come back to ground in between his intermittent uh, periods of, of displaying for the females in the area. It's a um, really pretty fascinating species that's, that's special to the, to the prairies here. And this great shot by Kyle Moon, we actually have prairie dogs in Montana and therefore we have burrowing owl in Montana as well. Um, they're kind of few and far between, but there's some really neat, um, you know, nesting colonies around the area, some close to Bozeman and some that we go to visit on the route that we do for the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem Trip. Uh, other owls that we can come across out in the open prairies include short-eared owl. It's um, one of the crowd pleasers, a really cool owl, widespread, and inhabits kind of the, the moist grasslands around here. And other raptors around that, uh, that are pretty highly sought after include the prairie falcon, which are very numerous in Montana. We even have several pairs that, that, that stay through the winter. And ferruginous hawk, which is a migratory species here. Um, it preys mostly on ground squirrels and prairie dogs. And in the winter, all of our ground squirrels and prairie dogs go into hibernation. So the ferruginous hawk, for the most part, leave. However, there are a couple warm spots in the state where they might stick around and, and feed off of rabbits and, and other such, such small prey. Rough-legged hawk is what comes down in winter to replace those raptors, and they feed mostly on voles, which we have a lot of as well. Other cool things to see in the winter in the prairies include sharp-tailed grouse on lek. So grouse lekking is always a really, really fun experience. And, uh, and these sharp-tailed grouse put on, put on quite a show with their tails up, booming, drumming, running around, stomping the ground. Uh, we have some, some really incredible uh, sharp-tailed grouse like in the States with 20 plus, 30 plus displaying birds that you can, you can enjoy pretty close to. But you've got to come usually pretty early when there's a bit of snow on the ground. So once summer hits, upland sandpipers start to show up along with returning long-billed curlew. Long-billed curlew, again, which many people see on their wintering grounds around Texas to the Gulf Coast, they show up in good numbers here to breed in the prairies, and they use that long bill to pick around for invertebrates and other goodies through that, uh, through that tall grass they like to inhabit. And probably the most ubiquitous, uh, or one of, American Robin being close to it, um, one of the most ubiquitous sounds and sights in Montana is that of the Western Meadowlark. Um, they pretty much inhabit almost any little open area they can find, um, all the way up to, to very high elevation. So, so yeah, Western Meadowlark, beautiful bird, lovely song, and uh, also found displaying on the prairies, alongside some of the more prized species and the more entertaining ones, like Billed Longspur. Uh, many of you might know it from its previous name, a lot of the names are, are changing now um, to reflect history and science. And, uh, and this, one's, this one's now called the Thick-Billed Longspur, was McCowan's Longspur. And once again, I threw in the obligatory cow patty shot because they like the same habitat that the uh, mountain plovers like. And so again, talking, talking short grass, really short grass, almost barren in spots. And, uh, and that's what they like to, like to forage in and, and nest in. So though they're not exceptionally colorful, perhaps, um, and if you've only seen them on wintering grounds, you wouldn't really necessarily see the appeal. But the big appeal is when they come to their breeding grounds and they display. And they have these really incredible 
parachute displays where they flare those chestnut epaulets on their shoulders and their bright white tails to really accentuate what color they do have. And they'll hang in the air for, for several minutes, just kind of circling around you and, uh, and putting on this really neat, uh, this neat display. And another great thing about it here is we have a couple sites where they're incredibly dense. So you can be hearing and seeing dozens of these things in the sky at any given time when you just stand around. And uh, it's, really, it's really a pretty exceptional time of year in the spring and early summer to enjoy what the prairies really had to offer with the pipits and the plovers and the longsbirds, everything displaying and, and, um, and really showing off. Uh, and of course, we also have chestnut colored longspur. They don't tend to have as incredible a display, at least on their breeding grounds here as the McCowns. They tend to be more of a songster. Uh, another fun mammal that I like to look for when we get onto kind of the sagier, drier, shark rat stuff, we have jackrabbit all the way up here in Montana. Um, but you seldom see them like this. You usually just see them like this, running dead away from you. They're, they're pretty shy and they're pretty fast. But uh, I just like the shot because you can see even the pads of their feet totally covered in fur. Um, really cool, really cool little animals, super adapted to, to the arid prairies and, and sage stead. So also in the prairie areas, you have big pans, whether they're kind of more alkaline or just lush depressions that have collected water um, that were glaciated over, over you know, the millennia. Uh, there are amazing prairie potable systems here which are really good for migrating shorebirds, breeding shorebirds, and breeding waterfowl. And most of those areas are kind of located in the central prairies. One of the species that people always like to look for, again, because I think they're more frequently encountered in non-breeding plumage than in, in this beautiful alternate plumage, is the Wilson's fowler oak. Um, I did see a couple records. I guess these guys even make it to South Africa on occasion here, um, getting a doing a little, little extensive reverse mirror migration. But, but yeah, we have thousands of Wilson's fallow that come through and some will linger to breed, um, including even in the park, in Yellowstone Park itself, despite the high elevation. And American Avocet. Uh, we do have a few breeding pair of American Avocet in the Central Prairies. Most migrate through one of the more spectacular things is in late April, they come through in huge number. And we have high counts of 2,600, 2,700 avocets at one site as they, as they pile through. And it's um, just truly an incredibly beautiful, beautiful bird. And you can see that, that recurve rostris. You can see the shape of the bill there, a little water droplet coming off of it. Uh, another pretty common shorebird that we have that does breed here in parts of the States is marbled godwit. Again, long bill, kind of similar to the curlew or the avocet that it uses to, to actually probe the, the wet prairie areas looking for invertebrates. And uh, again, they look pretty sharp in breeding plumage, get a little more color. And these guys just cruise all the way through going straight for the Arctic. I kind of like this photo because you can see how, how familiar this bird is with people. Uh, it has been banded several times and, uh, and goes all the way up to Barrow, Alaska um, from Northern South America. So really a long distance migrant that sometimes, uh, you know, we get to see well enough to, to photograph the bands and, and maybe even report it to see where that individual uh, bird has been um, during the course of its migration. And this was just photographed last week. We had a really neat push of long-billed dowagers. Again, more frequently encountered in, uh, in non-breeding plumage as a very gray kind of drab, very cryptic bird, hard to identify from short-billed dowager. But yeah, the dowagers just turned bright pink and beautiful in the, in the spring and summer. And we're far enough north to really get to see that, that, uh, that really nice color. Nice thing is we don't get too many short-billed dowagers, so, you know, you can kind of almost assume it's the long build. In this photo, you can kind of notice the, the shape of the bill as well. And another amazing species that does not breed here but comes through very beautiful, they come through in big numbers in both spring and fall, is the red-necked fowl row. 
And this is a, I like this photo because it shows a little bit about um, what makes phalarope rope in general quite unique. And it is that the females are the more colorful, um, the more brightly plumaged of the two, the two sexes. So the females are polyandrous and then the males do most of the, most of the rearing. And so they have the toned down colors. In this photo, the male is the individual in the back and the female is here in the foreground looking, looking super sharp. And of course we've got some waterfowl. Um, I like this shot, just the lighting on it was pretty spectacular. This is taken on a pond in Yellowstone. This is the ruddy duck and it's a really widespread, pretty common diving duck um, in North America with several congeners around the world that, uh, that look pretty similar, but they all look super sharp and breeding, bright blue bills, and they have a really neat display. But around here in our eco region, they tend towards really beautiful kind of montane ponds um, and lakes. So you get some pretty, pretty cool lighting. Um, another of the most amazing, you know, big birds around here are the trumpeter swan. We have several nesting pair of trumpeter swan in Yellowstone, in the greater Yellowstone region. Uh, we even have a few that nest on, on, you know, small but permanent stock ponds and some of the larger ranches in the region. And there was a great, great effort to make sure that, that these were reestablished in the park and, and in the area as uh, they had been, been hunted and, and really diminished in number, but now they're, they're doing well. Um, other swans that just cruise through include tundra swan, which are here in the winter. And we've got greater scop that come migrating through in pretty good numbers in May. Again, lesser scop being common year rounds. And this is one of the more sought after waterfowl species in the area, Barrow's golden eye. You can kind of see the difference, you know, the, the white going down its back is in individual spots rather than a streak. And it's got a bit of a smaller bill. The female has a very orange beak, but we have several nesting pair here that are actually quite common on some of the higher elevation um, streams and, and lakes and ponds. And again, this is taken from a, from a stock pond at a ranch nearby. Another pair of Barrow's golden eye. So now we're moving a little bit closer towards Yellowstone National Park proper. We've done a little bit of the prairies, a little bit of the potholes, enjoyed some migration, and a couple of the scenes coming down the Paradise Valley, which is really aptly named. It's a beautiful drive coming south into Yellowstone National Park through the Gardner entrance. Um, on the right, we have Emigrant Peak, and um, on the left, you're just kind of looking towards the Gallatin Range. Um, both of those were, were taken from where I live, so it's kind of nice. And um, this is kind of a version of the backdrop right here, Paradise Valley. So you really start to get into some, uh, some of the commoner birds, more of the woodland birds when you get into Paradise Valley. There's a lot of riparian areas, cottonwood corridors, kind of mixed forest habitats, and uh, American robins. It's a really cool capture by, by Kyle Moon getting that worm. American robins are at every elevation in every habitat um, once, you get, once you get out of the, the sage step in the, in the low desert. Uh, another very common species widespread throughout North America is black cat chickadee. And of course, we've even got some turkey. Granted, they were introduced a long time ago, but we've got, we've got a healthy population of beautiful palm turkeys uh, around the valley to enjoy and display. And one of the more recognizable and also common species um, in the valley is the mountain bluebird. Absolutely stunning bird. And the entire community has really embraced this species as one of the iconic species of the area. Um, lots of nest boxes on fence posts, and people love to, love to have these um, kind of adjoining their property for, for obvious reasons. But yeah, there's uh, loads of mountain bluebirds around. And it is that alongside cranes, the first harbinger of spring. So whenever we're coming out of, of winter, which does get long around here, um, we all get excited when we see our first bluebirds returning because we know that summer is soon. And then when summer finally hits, you get colorful birds like this. 
Western tanagers come back to people's feeders. And around here, some smart folks have put out jelly and fruit and all sorts of things. And they've got these coming to their back porch. Um, they start to arrive around kind of mid to late May. So right now is getting to be a really good time to see Western tanager all over the place. Very vocal, beautiful bird. And other feeder birds in the valley, which are just amazing. We're lucky enough to have these year round uh, is the evening grosbeak. Evening grosbeaks breed around here. Um, while I do make migrations kind of altitudinally, um, yeah, the evening grosbeak is certainly one of the favorites of, of all the bird and wildlife community around here, and certainly a fun subject to photograph. Not easy though, with those bright white flashes on the back. Another really fun widespread bird around here, given the vast coniferous forest, is the red crossbill. So we have several types of red crossbill here, and not to get too technical and get into the weeds about it, but it is interesting in that the shape of the crossbill's bill has evolved to its preferred seed type, whether it feeds off a Douglas fir or feeds off a ponderosa pine, that bill shape will evolve and change and actually look different than other red crossbills of other types that feed on, uh, on different things, whether it's hemlock or whatnot. So this is uh, our typical type around here in the valley is the Douglas fir type of red crossbill. This is a nice male. We also get a Cassin's finch. And so they do depart for the most, most, uh, most case in winter, but come back in force in about April. And it's one of the more beautiful birds that can be seen um, around town, around, around habituation. Um, we do have house finches as well, but where we are, Cassin's finch actually outnumber the house finch, which is really cool. Uh, another really common bird here year round, I think I took this photo in winter, is the pine siskin. So you can kind of see a trend. We get a lot of finches in the area, a lot of finches in the area, um, just due to, to all the seed and cone that's available. And another one of our favorite backyard birds, the calliope hummingbird. We don't have too many hummingbird types. We get rufous, a few broad-tailed here and there um, in migration, but the default hummingbird here is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful, this calliope hummingbird, which, uh, which just that, that flared gorget when he's displaying and singing is really, really something to see. That's a beautiful, beautiful bird. So we also get thrushes in the riparian areas here when spring comes back on and summer's back in full swing. Uh, believe it or not, one of the species that most people think of as being Eastern is this. This is the Viri, and it's got an amazing song that you can hear from the thickets in the riparian areas. Difficult species to get a photo of, so pretty proud to get this. Uh, more commonly, we have Swainson's thrush. Swainson's thrush begin to sing here in early June, and it is pretty much the soundtrack of the mountains in the summer all the way through to mid-August, actually. They are one of the latest singing species of all the singers in, uh, in the area, so yeah. Also in the riparian thickets and sticking to waterways are these beauties, it's widespread species, but always very exciting to see the cedar waxwing. We have good numbers of cedar waxwing in the summer. They are replaced in the winter. The American beaver is something else that we look for wrong in riparian areas. Um, they're pretty shy, pretty secretive, but one of the keystone and most important species in the mountain west of North America is the beaver. As a lot of the erosion and waterways and, and overall health of the various river and stream systems throughout the American west uh, is the American beaver. It's, uh, he's the constructor, he's the builder, and uh, also lets you know how, uh, how the status and health of your wetlands are looking in these big mountain valleys. And so we do have several family of beaver. Um, sometimes to people's chagrin, they show up a little too close to their, uh, their vacation homes and they can take down an aspen grove in a really short amount of time. Um, but it's always really great to, to see the new construction and, uh, and get to enjoy these, these really cool species. 
So other specialized habitats in the valley that you can get in Yellowstone Park, but in a little bit less number or it's higher up. So there's a little bit different species of sage. Um, one of the more important species is the sage thrasher. So again, often seen by folks kind of in their wintering grounds, sage thrasher here are the soundtrack from about late March, early April, all the way through to July for the sagebrush steppe and the more arid um, kind of almost deserty areas around central and um, central and western Montana. So we have lots of sage thrasher here, which are really fun to spend some time with. And then, of course, another indicator species of the health of high elevation sagebrush um, grasslands and sagebrush meadows is the brewer sparrow. So though this guy doesn't really look like much, he's got a great song and uh, in a very specific habitat type. You only really see him here when you have big chunks of healthy, mature uh, sagebrush that, that, they can, that they can nest in. And they're relatively low density. So when you get out there and you hear a few singing, you can get excited because you know that your sagebrush step is, is good and healthy. Another species that makes it here kind of at its western extreme in some of the sagey areas is the lark sparrow. I just really like this photo because you can see it's piling up to take a bunch of these uh, nymphs back to, to feed its young. So um, fly fishing being a big thing here, you can uh, almost tell what time of year it is by what that bird's holding in its beak. Another special species for the area that is really restricted to ponderosa type forests which we have a little bit of, again, kind of just at the northernmost extent of its range here in Montana, is the Plumbius vireo. We have the Douglas fir counterpart, the Cassin's vireo, but the Plumbius vireo, this species is only in Ponderosa pine kind of parky areas, as our brown creeper for the most part. It's a pretty cool photo. You can see how well they can hang upside down. But the brown creepers here um, are pretty scarce in the higher elevation forests and much more numerous in the, in the Ponderosa kind of open pine forests in the region. The cool bird. Um, other really fun birds that act a lot like a creeper or a nuthatch, we have tons and tons of woodpeckers. So Montana and the Western US in general is, is known for grouse and, and woodpeckers. They tend to be the other thing that pops in, in birders' minds anyways. And so here on the left, we have a downy woodpecker which is really common along the riparian areas, the rivers, where there's cottonwood essentially, and red nape sapsucker, similar MO, usually in kind of deciduous forests, beautiful birds um, that are really common in, in the Paradise Valley. And this lovely photo is, uh, is a hairy woodpecker, which are usually only found in kind of dense old growth forests and burns, but, uh, but around here we've got a few that have even, uh, even adapted to come to people's homes and, and eat a little seed, maybe even eat a little peanut butter during the winter because winters do get cold and long around here. My favorite woodpecker perhaps, and, and perhaps that for many, is the Lewis's woodpecker. Uh, this spectacular bright pink woodpecker, which also iridesces green in the back, is, um, is really only kind of a woodpecker by, uh, by lineage and, and also by its nesting. They spend a lot of time fly catching. And so we have two sites in the greater Yellowstone eco region that Lewis's woodpeckers have found a home. It's really quite far to the east for them and to the north. And those are in old burns that went so hot that all the scrub was left bare and really hasn't regrown back. So you have these big open areas, like kind of wet meadows with very tall trees that are burned that are easy to make holes in and also really easy to sit on top of and call from, like this guy's doing. And even more importantly, sally out and catch their, their winged insect prey. So instead of spending as much time digging through the bark of trees to look for larvae and hammering into trees to look for their food source, they actually do a lot of it actively fly catching from exposed perches on tops of trees. Really cool bird. And almost as a novelty, this is about as far west as they get, we get red-headed woodpecker in the same spot. So you can actually go out and you can see Lewis's woodpecker 
and red-headed woodpecker, which to me are two of the most beautiful woodpeckers on earth, um, in the very same place. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty unique situation there. We got some owls, but you gotta go look for them. Um, they're usually, uh, this guy especially, Western Screech Owl. Not too many reports from inside Yellowstone itself, but there are a few spots where they roost, like this one. Uh, this was actually taken in uh, downtown Bozeman on one of the nature trails there called the Sourdough Nature Trail. Um, they're really pretty acclimated to people, but just kind of spread and, and few and far between. Another owl that's in the area, but you have to go to specific places for, mostly very wet, dense, densely forested canyons in the area, is this barred owl. So uh, barred owls spend a lot of their time looking for amphibians and, of course, some small rodent prey. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a really special bird, too. And for those tuning in from the East Coast, that who cooks for you is just such, a, such an iconic sort of memorable sound. And uh, yeah, one that you hear often. Here in, uh, in the greater Yellowstone eco region, there's only a few pairs of these. Other cool birds that we see in the valley include osprey. Uh, we have lots of nesting osprey. The culture here is very much related to water. So we have a lot of rivers, a lot of lakes, and therefore um, even kind of lay people who aren't too into or are educated about outdoors, nature, birds, um, even they'll recognize the osprey. Everybody loves an osprey. Osprey and bald eagle are, are really huge around here in the culture. And there were very large efforts and continue to be to build nesting platforms for the osprey in the area. So that's really helping their success. And those are all community-based initiatives. It's very cool. Uh, I included this fairly horrible photo <laughs> for its novelty in that there's a golden eagle in a tree. Um, golden eagles are common here, actually. It's their high number, spectacular predator of, um, of almost all habitats in Montana. Anywhere they can find a cliff to nest on. Well, this guy didn't have a cliff. It's the only golden eagle nest I've seen in uh, high up in a tree. This is a very, very large cottonwood tree in the nearby Shields Valley. You can see a couple little heads there with some, with some down sticking up. This is the fifth year that I've seen these eagles nesting here. And uh, it's just kind of incredible because golden eagles don't nest in trees, so people, so people say. Uh, but on occasion when they have to, they'll, uh, they'll take over an old bald eagle nest, no problem. And now that brings us to Yellowstone proper. So this is one of the many scenic panoramas that you see kind of driving through the park and, and just sunsets and sunrises in Yellowstone are, are truly spectacular. And this is something, of course, that everybody hopes for, wolves in winter. So we'll talk a little bit about the seasons in Yellowstone as we go through the park as well, because it's a very different experience coming here in the summer from the winter, and both are incredibly worthwhile and rewarding. So Yellowstone National Park, this is kind of a blow up of the park map. We come in from the very north part on our route in Gardner. You'll see north entrance up by Mammoth Hot Springs there at the top of your screen. And we work our way east across the northern range or the northern roads towards Cook City and Silvergate in the top right. And this takes us through a few different habitats. Um, it's mostly going to be montane meadow, some sagebrush, a few lakes, and a lot of forest. And it's kind of neat because that route really allows you access to all of the main and desired habitats. And this route actually has the highest density of mammals in the park. Um, and so it really just increases your opportunity to, to have some time, spend some time with wolves bears, etc. So you can kind of see the route a little better there, coming in from Gardner, cruising across the top by Tower and Roosevelt. And sometimes the first thing you'll see right when you get in the park it can be some of the most exciting, of course, pronghorn antelope, pretty common in the area, but you also get bighorn sheep, which are spectacular. Uh, bighorn sheep, whether they're in rut or not in rut, um, especially the rams, are just, uh, are just impressive, impressive creatures. 
and you can find them throughout the year um, in various spots. They move around in elevation, but there are some favorite haunts that we have to go and, and spend some time with, uh, with these majestic guys. It's really, really incredible. That male especially can see the musculature in the neck for when they get into rut. It's really cool. And so, um, so yeah, spend a little time looking at bighorn sheep, various, various angles and ways. And um, again, in the winter, sometimes the lighting and the scenery is even a little more dramatic. Uh, but another of the common things that we see as we come in through uh, the north entrance, Mammoth Hot Springs is one of, if not the best area in the park for elk. And so here you have a bugling elk that is, uh, is really just giving it his all here in the, in the morning sun. And um, this, this sort of spectacle happens in the fall. So more of a September, uh, early October thing where the, you know, the big bulls get together and, uh, and kind of, you know, they fight essentially to territorialize and claim their harem and claim the females that they're gonna, gonna breed with. And one of the big ways that they display similar to many bird species is uh, they sing. And so bugling elk is uh, one of the sounds, one of the more spectacular sounds uh, that you can hear in the, uh, in the Northern American West in the fall, just being out in the forest and hearing these, these piercing bugling sounds is, is really spectacular. And they're almost always looking, you know, amazing and majestic with, with some pretty cool expansive backdrops. And of course, one of the uh, most sought after birds that people come to Yellowstone for, although they aren't easy um, and not always approachable, depending on the season, is the great gray owl. Um, we actually do have many, many nesting pairs of great gray owls in the park, most of which are in wilderness areas, distant meadows, kind of away. There are a few pairs uh, around the park that have become relatively accustomed to traffic and, and viewership if you want to call it that. There's a couple pair that become pretty famous and, and people know to stop and look for them in their, in their areas. Uh, you're much more likely to run into one of these guys first. Mountain chickadee, super common, pretty ubiquitous, or a common raven, plenty common ravens around. Uh, and they're a really kind of neat indicator species to watch for if you want to look for charismatic megafauna because they tend to go towards carcasses. And so whenever there's been a kill, let's say a grizzly bear or wolves, et cetera, you'll see a lot of ravens around looking to uh, sneak in and get a portion of that. So sometimes easier than looking for the carcass itself, even these huge 600 pound grizzly bears or whatever they're coming to it, a lot of times it's easier to watch the skies and watch the grounds for, um, for dozens of common raven kind of coming together in a small area to, uh, to feast on that carcass when the wolves and the bears give them an opportunity. Uh, another common bird in the park and always beautiful to see, another evening grosbeak. And depending on the season, you can bump into quite a few of these. Um, they're a lot of fun. Alongside Jay's, the Clark's Nutcracker have, uh, have made themselves in a couple places pretty familiar with people. And so you can kind of watch their antics and their acrobatics. And in some places, you also need to watch your lunch because they will swoop down and, uh, and take a snack if they, if they can. Other common species that you'll probably run into, pink-sided junco or the dark-eyed junco. I'm sort of giving myself away there. I swore I wouldn't get, get into like the pink-sided Oregon debates and all this, but dark-eyed junco, lots of different types. We get every single kind in Montana um, at some point in the year. So a lot of the local birders like to separate those out. And then, of course, bald eagle. Lots of beautiful opportunities to observe and, and photograph and enjoy bald eagle in the park. Um, throughout the region, they're doing really well. Uh, very, very kind of dense and common along the, uh, the bigger waterways, especially the Yellowstone River uh, itself and its, its tributaries. So, so yeah, um, a lovely common sight to see now, the emblem of North America. Plenty of bald eagles to enjoy. And you can also watch them being harassed by ravens, which is a pretty common thing, given that they like to scavenge the same stuff. So the bald eagles here not only fish, but they're also attracted to carcasses. 
And so you'll get a lot of bald eagle raven interaction, especially at carcasses where everybody's vying for those last bits of meat that are left over. Uh, golden eagles are not to be discounted as well. You often have bald eagle, golden eagle, and ravens at the same carcass. And uh, it's pretty, pretty impressive to behold, especially in the winter snows. Another wonderful winter bird. They're there year round, but become very gregarious and loud and friendly in winter is the Canada Jay. It used to be called the, the gray Jay. And um, it's a really, a really fun bird to be around. The local name here that you'll hear a lot talking to folks is Camp Robber. Uh, whether they've been <laughs> sort of domesticated or not, you can show up at a lot of campgrounds, especially picnic area style campgrounds, and uh, there'll be a Canada J flock around and they'll be watching. They like to come in like the nutcrackers do on occasion and, and uh, see if they can get a cracker or a cookie or a bite of your sandwich. But, uh, but yeah, so they've got the, the kind of fun loving name Camp Robber that a lot of the folks here have, have, have given them. Another bird of the winter. This replaces that beautiful cedar waxwing, which is a bird mostly here of spring and summer, is this bohemian waxwing. And the bohemian waxwing, or as it's known in Europe and Asia, just waxwing, um, is, uh, is one of the most numerous birds here in winter. Um, the caveat to that is you have to come across the flock. So a small flock of bohemian waxwing here would be say 200, 300 birds. And then all come together into a juniper patch or a berry patch and, and really just eat up all the resources, uh, making the towns and solitaires completely lose their minds. Um, but yeah, flocks 1,200, 1,500, uh, flocks up to 2,000 um, can occur pretty regularly in the winter. And it's, and it's absolutely an incredible sight to see. Uh, the winter is also a great time for photographing other resident birds like this lovely American Dipper. And uh, this is a young of the year bird. It's got a lot of yellow in its beak. But, um, but yeah, it's a really cool time for photography to sort of um, try a few different things and have a different viewpoint on the birds that, you know, you see in, in the green. Um, this is one of my favorite times. It's sort of early spring, say April. Uh, when you have all the displaying grouse and the grouse are awesome. So in Yellowstone itself, there are some great short trails to see grouse, including ruffed grouse like this one. And um, we're able to, to sit there and watch him. This was just taken a couple weeks ago. Watch this, uh, this male ruffed grouse do his display. It's drumming on top of the, on top of the tree trunk. And of course, always exciting to run into the dusky grouse. They've got so much personality and they're so bold that, uh, that you can really just hang out and watch them do their display and do their thing. And again, this dusky grouse, the next few photos here, were taken on the same trail as the rough grouse um, within about a 20 minute walk of each other. So pretty spectacular bird. You can see those big, beautiful, eye combs and, and he's about to flare his inflated neck patch a little bit, which you can see some of in this image here. Yeah, dusky grouse, an amazing bird to spend time with. We had four displaying males on this one trail. So yeah, not, uh, if you go to the right spot, you've got a really good chance of spending some quality time with, uh, with this guy. And other things to see in the winter. This is such a perfect classic shot here. Um, some frosty bison weathering the snow. Um, winters here really, they really are harsh and impressive. And uh, the animals that thrive in them um, can, be, uh, can be equally impressive with their thick coats of fur. And these guys, when they get close to geothermal features, will get covered in that steam and mist that crystallizes. It's absolutely stunning. And so you get a lot of this as well. This is other things that, you know, folks, images that folks come to Yellowstone in the winter to capture. On the right, there's some iconic hoarfrost over by Buffalo Ridge. And then on the left, a gray wolf howling atop a sagebrush hill. But yeah, very, very classic, amazing stuff. And uh, this was a, a pretty incredible capture um, by Kate Oxman here. These are, um, these are some wolves feasting on a bison kill here. 
and uh, so you can get a lot of a lot of you know more grisly scenes perhaps uh, because there are, mostly it's because there are fewer people here in the winter and a lot of the wildlife is concentrated just onto the areas where the roads would be which are closer to the rivers and in the lower elevations there's only one road open in Yellowstone in the winter and that's the road from our access here in the north out of Gardner Montana so if you want to visit Yellowstone in the winter you can take a snow coach into the interior to say Old Faithful which is wonderful but you can also just drive in uh, where we are on, on this north side and uh, you can go through the entire famous Lamar Valley and again just have some amazing wildlife experiences uh, any time of year including summer another fantastic capture um, a kid of a really cool cool wolf we've got a lot of black wolves here um, in brindles and in the color scale rather than being predominantly gray as they are in most areas um, is much darker here so yellowstone wolves are, are pretty famous um, obviously uh, you know in the area there's a lot of legislation both for and against and there's a lot of kind of back and forth with with that whole idea um, and it's become on the minds of Coloradans as well as legislation passed to uh, to kind of consider the reintroduction of wolves into Colorado also. But yeah, the gray wolf was here in Yellowstone National Park when it was founded um, and they were systematically exterminated um, over the course of about 30 years or so and were absent um, except for a lone sighting here and there up until the reintroduction relocation program began in 1995. And uh, a grand total of, um, I think it was 24, 25 wolves were acclimated in wilderness pens uh, that were large so they could interact with each other because they were brought from, from various different packs around Canada. And they could, they could kind of form their bonds in a safe, a safe way and in a wilderness way and then they were gradually released out into, uh, into the greater ecosystem. And um, now they're, they're thriving, they're doing very well. Um, again, a little bit of controversy around the hunting practices adopted um, around the park in both Montana and Wyoming, but that's one of the reasons why Yellowstone is the best place to enjoy and observe gray wolves um, in what was their natural habitat, doing what wolves do, denning, you know, hunting, doing all this kind of fun stuff. And so as you can see with the information on the left side of the screen, uh, current population, um, at least 94 wolves in eight packs. One of this year's dens has seven pups in it, which is really spectacular. So, so yeah, the wolves uh, within the park are doing really well and it's a, a wonderful place to come to, to watch them and enjoy them. Not a wolf. A lot of times in the winter, people confuse them, but you got to look at the muzzle, look at kind of the thin muzzle, um, pointy ears, and again, they're gonna they're gonna look a bit smaller. But in winter, lovely and fluffy is the coyote. There are plenty of coyotes in uh, in Yellowstone as well, but they do tend to be uh, well away from the wolves. Obviously, you know the wolves are are king of the canids here, and so the coyotes kind of they hang back um, at kills, at carcasses, and stuff like that. But usually around trying to try to sneak in and, and get a bite as well they're very successful hunters bulls and other things also a smaller prey than the wolves would go for the wolves are mostly focusing on elk and and, and bison and such uh, whereas the the coyote are, are usually focusing on on smaller prey uh, another really amazing predator in the park um our river otter and there are quite a few spots to enjoy river otters. There's several dens around the park. Um, a lot of times they'll come out of the winter river systems and move up to, to higher alpine lakes. An amazing thing here in Yellowstone is because since it is uh, volcanic and there's a lot of warm water around, is there's a lot of open water all year long. So anything that's sort of aquatic based um, can keep, have and keep a, a, a stronghold here and, uh, and make it through the winters and not have to necessarily leave. And, uh, and otters are, are one of those that do really well. And winter is actually the best time to observe otters. It's also kind of the most exciting time to see any mustelid. 
So mustelids are referring to, to weasels in general. We've got a bunch of different species, ermine, mink, you know, all this kind of fun stuff. Um, and they all go white in the winter, which is really, really cool to see this little white streak running through the bushes. Um, also, vicious little predators, uh, super fast, efficient little killers, but, uh, but adorable, not to anthropomorphize too much, but yes. And this is one of the mustelids around that does not go white, but really gets a thick coat in the winter. It's a pine marten. And the pine marten is, uh, again, just an amazing creature, a fairly large weasel that hunts anything from squirrels to uh, bird's eggs, to all sorts of, all sorts of kind of medium to smaller prey. Um, but there are a few areas and, and specific locations where they've gotten used to the people that, that kind of come and go. So again, Yellowstone is probably one of the better places, certainly in North America, if not the world, to come and, uh, and watch the, the antics and goings on of Pine Martin. There's um, the residents not too far outside of Yellowstone that several Pine Martin congregate around um, for and have done so for, for decades, kind of in this little neighborhood area. It's really cool. So anyways, yeah, Pine Martin, another fabulous thing to see in the winter. And moose in the winter, of course. Moose any time of year, but in the winter with these big, huge antlers um, looking pretty spectacular in the whole frost here. Um, and then even small stuff looks cool in the winter. You got your little Western North American red squirrel. And uh, they always cache their cones um, at the base of trees so they can store those up for the winter. And it's fun to watch them sit on a branch and just pick through a pine cone and they'll run to their stash and then run right back up to the same spot and eat another pine cone. So they're pretty fun to watch. And in late spring, we do have a lot of snow. And as you probably know, bears hibernate, but they usually come out of hibernation here in March. And so there's plenty of, of really neat snow events that are yet to come. So it's, it's kind of spectacular opportunity to actually get to see bears in snow. Which, uh, which you don't normally have access to. So uh, this is a black there, bear that we photographed during a, a really intense snowstorm a few weeks ago. And um, this is kind of the way you more commonly see a black bear. They're just kind of foraging at the edge of the forest in a meadow, digging for some roots. Um, they're mostly omnivorous. So they, uh, they do spend a lot of time just kind of, kind of lounging and digging around and, um, and being, you know, Pretty, pretty friendly in the sense of you can, you can spend a little time watching them doing what they do. They're not as threatening or, or quite as volatile as grizzly bears, though any bear can, uh, can get very defensive depending on the aspis. So we're all very bear aware around here. And this is an interesting more for this black bear, American black bear. It's called a cinnamon bear. Um, I think a lot of times grizzlies can, or black bears can be confused for grizzlies. As here, we do have several blonde and cinnamon colored black bears. And just like this bear is doing, they do spend some time in trees foraging. And this is something that everybody loves to see when they come to Yellowstone, grizzly bear. And it's pretty rare that you get it in a field with buttercups and larkspur like these are, which is just like spectacular flashes of color. Um, but, um, but you do get to see, especially this time of year, late May and June, Lots of grizzly bear. Just by, by nature, they're out in the open, more open habitats. And again, this time of year, kind of digging for roots and, and finding kind of the easier food to, uh, to come across as they, as they continue to fatten up. And so uh, you can see the structural difference here. Look for that big shoulder hump. So if the shoulder hump is higher than the rump hump, then it's going to be a grizzly bear. And that's a pretty good way to, to tell them apart. Um, and this one has a really cute um, cub of the year with it in this photo here. And there's that cub just being adorable. Another neat thing about the grizzly bears or a way to tell them apart too, is if you look at the, the shape of the nose, they almost have a little bit more of a pig nose kind of shape than a black bear, which have really, really narrow noses. Grizzly bears don't have amazing sight, um, decent hearing, but they, but they have incredible noses. And, um, and they do a lot, of, a lot of their survival, a lot of their foraging off of their sense of smell. Just some general stats for the bears in Yellowstone. This is why it's 
again, maybe one of the best places, if not the, in North America to watch bears is um, we have plenty of both black and grizzly bears. You see here conservative estimates of 500 to 550 American black bears in the park. Um, they're mostly in the forested habitats. So almost you can differentiate the two by habitat. Occasionally the black bear will wander out to the forest edge into meadows to forage, but you rarely find grizzlies in the forest. They're almost entirely in open areas, big sagebrush step areas, digging around sometimes, sometimes hunting. Um, I have seen a grizzly bear take elk on occasion. Um, so yeah, they do go for bigger things, but yeah, almost by habitat, you can say, well, in this, in this little part of the park, there's probably gonna be more black bears. This part of the park, there's gonna be more grizzly bears. Although on a, any given day, um, you know, in spring around here, kind of this time of year, you're gonna see several of both species um, really every day that you go into the, into the park. It's, it's really, really spectacular. The other day we had 13 bears um, when I was in the park. I had 11 grizzly bears and two black bears. Just incredible, incredible encounters. And as you notice here, referring to the hibernation, um, yeah, they, they come back out in March and they kind of stay inactive hibernating, hibernating from early mid-December until, uh, until that time in March when they tend to, tend to come out. A few individuals will come out at the end of February. On occasion. Other animals that you see just kind of running around Lamar Valley, again, the Richardson's ground squirrel are pretty, pretty cute and common. They're only around in the summer. And another strictly summer thing, because again, they hibernate, unlike the bears do, is a yellow-bellied marmot. So you can get yellow-bellied marmots uh, in various spots, and, and they're pretty fun to watch as well. It's a big rodent. And a very tiny rodent, but arguably the cutest in the park area, is uh, pica, the American pica. And so um, they just make this little meat sound, and they'll sit on top of rocks and rock falls, and really just, uh, just, just darn cute, especially when the males begin to court the females because they have kind of a song, like a whistle song of sorts, and they'll collect a bunch of flowers and, and other things and actually bring those to her. Uh, of course, she's not going to look at the flowers. She's going to eat them, but she, they bring those to her to, uh, you know, to, to court her in a sense. Um, it's a pretty neat thing to watch. And there's one barking at me a little bit, and they're pretty, pretty awesome. Typically high elevation, 7,000 feet elevation and up. Another cool thing about summer is babies. And so uh, this is a, a shot of a moose with, with a calf there. And, um, and yeah, you know, a lot of people like to come this time of year so you can enjoy the, the baby moose, baby bison, um, all that kind of fun stuff. And of course, nest building and baby birds. So uh, the American cliff swallow here, this one's putting its mud nest together over by a very classic nesting spot called Soda Butte. And um, yeah, it's this neat old volcanic plug that has kind of a, a hard base that the cliff swallows have used for uh, decades and decades to, to, place their, to place their nests, construct, to construct their nests on. Uh, yeah, here's another good example of some fun uh, breeding behavior in birds. This canyon wren is, uh, is bringing back that's a little moth, looks like. He's beating the wings off of it already. But he's bringing a moth back to the nest to feed youngsters um, in one of the more popular um, known breeding areas for canyon wren. Again, pretty far north for the species. They don't get much past here um, in, uh, in Yellowstone. And of course, plenty of displaying Wilson snipe, which if you go out at night and you're not careful, you can mistake as a, a territorializing boreal owl. The boreal owls aren't gonna sing at the same, same time these guys win usually. So. so anyways, lots of lots of Wilson snipe doing their fun displays in the area. And always uh, a crowd pleaser, due to all the open water and just how much water resources available to us here around the Yellowstone, um, American Dipper are, are just all over the place and, uh, and love and life. And so it's, it's really fun to be able to go out every day and, um, and find some American Dipper on the, the rivers and streams. Um, beautiful birds to watch. And then, of course, in spring and summer, 
you get some of these slightly dumb here little juveniles, but they're also just adorable. Learning the ropes with their parents, jumping around the rocks, trying to trying to dive and, and, and swim for the larva underneath the rocks. Um, really, really fun to watch. And this is probably for Yellowstone birders anyways, one of the more exciting things to see in the year because it means this summer is truly on. The return of Harlequin ducks. So yeah, the uh, Harlequin ducks um, fly up the tributaries uh, of the Yellowstone and then fly up the Yellowstone itself in search of breeding territories. And they show up around mid-May and they're mostly gone by mid to late June. So it's a really kind of short, spectacular window and such an amazingly beautiful bird um, that you know they winter in saltwater um, on the Pacific or on the Atlantic. And uh, interestingly enough, not sure actually which way these guys go. Yellowstone is east of the Continental Divide, so maybe they come from the east, uh, despite the west being much closer. But yeah, amazing, an amazing bird that you can see in good number in, uh, in spring around here, um, the harlequin deck. And so the males usually show up first, make a territory, and uh, females come in and make a vort. And uh, yeah, got at least 25 breeding pairs in the park. Um, we kind of size that up by, by the number of uh, females that have young. But uh, yeah, the species does well in Yellowstone. And again, given that they're, you know, more or less used to, used to people with the high visitation in the park, they're pretty tolerant of, um, you know, what, what you can do and, and what you can see and how close you can, you can get to them and spend time with them. Um, in, in Yellowstone. And for these, we were just lucky enough to have some amazing, amazing afternoon light on the Soda Butte Creek for this pair. And I just can't get into follow conducts. So I just take a lot of photos of them. They're great. Um, other really cool spring summer birds Williamson sapsucker, common in the park. Uh, warbling vireo, common everywhere in the American West, of course, but you know, we've got this Western type that has this pretty cool song. And of course, plenty of Audubon's warbler that show up with the onset of summer as well, kind of into May. And yeah, this is just, again, an iconic view of, of a bison here in the Yellowstone. And, and as we leave the Yellowstone, um, you know, you kind of think back on all the fun things that we're seeing. Um, but there's still more ahead. <laughs> you exit the park and you go even higher up towards what we call the, what's called the Beartooth Pass. So um, I believe it's the highest paved road in Montana. It's one of the highest in the country, getting up to almost 11,000 feet. And on the way up, people love to look for this bird, Pine Grosbeak. Again, relatively uh, regularly seen, pretty easy to see in the area and an absolutely stunning bird that, um, that can be difficult through much of its range, much of the year. But, uh, but yeah, just heading northeast out of the park, there's some good places to view Pine Grosbeak. Um, and this is what the road looks like. So <laughs> this is the road actually coming down on the far side of Beartooth Pass towards Red Lodge in uh, the aptly named Hell Roaring Canyon. It's an incredible drive that goes up over this amazing pass with just stunning vistas. And these, you can see the 20 mile an hour speed limits in there, but it's just these incredible curves through the truly uh, unparalleled scenery. Um, for me, it's, it's the best, best ride in, in, um, in the lower 48 at least. And, uh, and it also has the added motivation of uh, being a good place to see black rosy finch, which is uh, one of the tougher of the rosy finches for sure. So black rosy finch, they descend in elevation to feeders in the area um, and kind of just wintering grounds, but there are some pretty cool feeders in winter to go check them out at, um, where they often mingle with gray crown rosies. But in the summer, they go up to the uh, really high elevation, just alpine tundra, um, high glacial fields, permanent areas where there's permanent snowpack, and they nest on cliff overhangs where glaciers have, have made carved out um, intense glacial cirques. And so it's, uh, yeah, seeing a black rosy finch nest, not easy to do. It was years before they discovered them. 
and they're very difficult to continue to study uh, just by the access. But such a, a spectacular kind of scenery and, and way to see them. Um, and they're almost always in the presence of these. Um, one of my favorite bovids, a uh, mountain goat. Um, at the Beartooth Pass, there are two herds of mountain goat that again have kind of become accustomed to traffic and people walking around. And uh, and yeah, you can see them, especially in the spring with their with their young, their kids out, and uh, spend a little time with this with these beautiful shaggy creatures up in some of the more spectacular uh, scenery on the planet. And if you're lucky, you'll get to see a little bit of these sort of interactions on the snowpacks. This is July. The mountain goat are actually wandered out onto the snowpack to cool off. Because, you know, 60 degrees is hot for them. So. <laughs> and uh, one of the things at the very top of the mountain that you hope to see is uh, flowers. There just happens to be an American pipit in this shot. But, but yeah, American pipits inhabit these amazing alpine kind of tundra grasslands that at certain times of year are absolutely covered in flowers, uh, 14 species of which are in this photo. And uh, that, that concludes it. That's the route through the greater Yellowstone ecoregion. And um, yeah, there's always tons to see, but, um, but thank you all for, for joining and um, hope, you, hope you found it informative and fun. And um, yeah, uh, photo credits. Thank you for all the other contributing photographers to, to this presentation. And uh, yeah, happy for a little Q&A. Oh, thank you, Forrest. And before Keith and Forrest dive into some excellent Q&A, a reminder that next webinar, June the 2nd, will feature Ghana with Dr. Daniel Dankwitz with uh, several representatives from key bird family. So we're quite excited about that. And the webinars in the series are being offered free of charge, should you, however, wish to donate to our clients, uh, uh, sorry, to our tour leaders, our GoFundMe donation link is still open. You can see it's late on the side for me. <laughs> As many of you are well aware, travel is starting to open up and not only on the domestic front, but international as well. Uh, just today, Keith, uh, you were mentioning that if you're keen on any last minute getaways, we have just had one space open up on our Uganda Highlights Tour in July, while there are a couple of spots left with our Alaska trips through Nome, Denali, and Kene. Um, but yeah, over to you guys. Thanks. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Forrest, wonderful once again. Um, I think it's your I think it's your third your third webinar you've done with us now, right? Yeah, third or fourth, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so I mean, like, who's keeping count? <laughs> yeah, absolutely no, fantastic. Great. Okay, wow, yeah, let's go. Um, lots of fantastic yeah. comments coming through. Yeah, people loved it. Um, just dive in here yeah, first because it's just in the chat section, never made it through to the QA, I don't think. But uh, Mike was just asking here, uh, Forrest, quite superb, thanks. If my number one target was American Badger, which areas are favored and what time of the year gives you the best chance? Um, I think it'd probably be kind of, again, early, probably early spring um, when, they're, when they're really kind of coming, coming out of their burrows. They've got to they've feed young. They've got to be really active. And they're kind of in all sorts of, all sorts of habitats. I mean, they're in you know, the Lamar Valley, which is just kind of open and covered in bison. Um, but they're also in even agricultural areas and plains being really adept predators. Um, they, uh, they can survive in, in quite a lot of spots, but they're intensely territorial and they don't like much competition. So yeah, they are kind of hard to come by. There are some den sites um, in the park itself. And there are also some den sites outside of the park that we're familiar with. Um, but yeah, if you wanted to just try to stumble into one, uh, Lamar Valley is a, a, a pretty good bet, um, which is sort of the kind of the Eastern, it's, it's a classic wildlife watching spot there in kind of the Northeastern part of the park. Um, and then of course in, in maybe Hayden Valley as well, which is more central 
in the park north of the lake. Um, it's a similar situation. We have a lot of open areas, a lot of, a lot of meadow and a lot of visibility. One of the hardest thing about seeing badgers is that they're low slung. They're just so close to the ground, you know, so they can be hard to spot. Yeah. Thanks, Forrest. Number of good tips there. Um, I have to admit, if I was going to Yellowstone, American badger would definitely be right at the top of my list. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the honey badger back here in Africa. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, they're, mean, they're, that's they're, just, they're equally cool, like super charismatic yeah. and, and tough. Just tough little yeah. guys. Exactly, exactly. They, they look like it. Solid, solid little guys. But as you say, yeah. low slant to the ground, you know, not, not easy to pick up, but kind of similar to, to honey badgers in, in a way. Um, nice. Cool. So um, Sherry's just asked me a quickie, um, which I'll deal with. She's saying, I see you have two Yellowstone trips this year. And obviously these Yellowstone offerings are actually quite new for us. I mean, Forrest, you, you've just really, you know, put, put those together for us. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something quite new that we're offering. And we've, we've got those two trips this year. They, they both fully subscribe. But um, she's just mentioning here that there's only the one listed for 2022. Um, are we going to be adding any other departures for 2022? Yeah, yeah. I guess we could say the situation is dynamic. We're actually probably going to offer, we're offering another one for even later this year. So again, kind of, you know, as the presentation illustrated, there, there are certain times of year for, for different experiences, all year being good. Um, but we're going to offer kind of a, a winter, a winter wildlife birds and photography trip, um, which, which I think will be in 2022 kind of early, but we're also going to put together, um, a fall early winter package, um, this year. And that kind of focuses on, um, owls and, and you can get your, your woodpeckers and you can get, um, really good wildlife experiences such as the elk rut the end of the bison rut. So you get all this like amazing, like gladiator style action with your big charismatic megafauna. And then in September and October is probably, um, it's one of the best times, not the best time for, for bears and wolves close to the road. Again, being very active. They're starting to pack up again after having den the wolves are. So you can get big groups. This last year, um, the Junction View pack alone was 34 individuals in one wolf pack. And sometimes you just, you'd see all of them. Um, it's just kind of amazing. So, so yeah, we've got a couple other offerings that are coming up. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks yeah. I should have those advertised by the, I've just been running and it's been really crazy, but, but yeah, it should be advertised by uh, early next week. Oh, all yeah. good. All good. <laughs> thanks for us. That gives a, it gives a nice, um, rundown for everyone. Um, yeah. Thanks so much folks as well for just for staying on. Uh, we've got to, you know, quite a few questions to go here in the Q&A, but really appreciate you guys uh, sticking around. Um, Linda, well, Tyson was just what you've been saying for us, but Linda's just saying, sounds like we need to visit several times, winter, spring, summer. Um, it, it's, it, does, it does seem to vary quite a bit between the seasons. And, and I guess, look, if, you, if you're based in, in the US or, you know, somewhat locally, at least it's not that far, you're not at the, you know, you don't have to cross international borders to get in. Uh, but it does seem like a place that does change quite a lot um, seasonally. Um, it does. And, and as yeah. you mentioned, we are offering trips at a, at a variety, or will be offering trips at quite a variety uh, of different times of the year. Um, Hala's Hall asking here, she says, thank you for a thrilling presentation. I've always wanted to go to Yellowstone. How difficult is the walking? And do you stay at different lodges along the way? So for the route that we do in the, that I, you know, kind of base the presentation on, we do stay in different lodges to be in good proximity to, to the, uh, the wildlife that we're going for. Um, the the walking is really laid back, actually. It's, it's, it's very easy. Depends on what you want to do. You know, if you, if you kind of show up hoping to look for a wolverine or something, then the walking is going to be tough. But if you, uh, if you want to just look for, you know, if you want to see the birds, see the bison, see the wolves, see the bears, all that, it, it's, it's, it's very, 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 very easy. Um, and, you know, we typically have kind of everything staked out to, to keep it kind of low impact. Um, and we, we don't actually in, in the national park like to necessarily walk off trail a ton anyways, um, just to kind of lower the impact and, and be good role models for, for conduct that way. Um, so the, the, the walking is really, really manageable. The lodging that we do have, we usually spend two to three nights at, at each place when we go. You really only have to stay in, in three places essentially to cover all of the habitats that, that, we, that we cover on it from the prairies and wetlands to the, the highest 
you know, 11,000 feet alpine tundra. Um, it's, it's got a really neat road system that we take full advantage of. Fantastic, Forrest. Sounds great. Um, and what are those accommodations like? Uh, Margaret's just wanting to know. Um, great. I mean, you can spend yeah. 3,000 bucks a night or you can spend, you know, 60 bucks a night. Um, it's, uh, you know, given the amount of visitation that's out there, um, you know, kind of all levels are, are catered to. Um, we, we tend to shoot kind of mid-range. So, you know, we have a very good, you know, sort of three-star, very typical accommodation, but it usually is kind of cabin, lodge style. Um, there's good food available and, uh, and yeah, we can, we can find really nice infrastructure, uh, close to, close mm. to what we're going for. Ah, sounds, sounds fantastic. Spot on for us. Um, right. A couple more. Uh, Joni's just wondering, is the tour suitable for non-birding spouses? What's your feel on that? I think it's probably one of the most suitable for non-birding spouses. Um, you know, we, cause it, I mean, just by virtue of staying, you know, multiple nights in places, but also having the broader appeal of, of seeing some of the geothermal features of learning a little bit of the history as we go along on some of the drives between sightings and, and, um, and birds and, and wildlife, um, you know, there's really just kind of a lot to offer if you come in the, well, even in the winter, it depends on, you know, if you're properly equipped, but fly fishing is good most of the year, except at high water. Um, there's rafting opportunities in the summer, uh, loads of, loads of hiking. Um, and in, and in certain areas, you know, like closer to Livingston or Jackson, there's really amazing, um, art even to be seen. It's, it's kind of, you know, it's such an inspirational place and so heavily yeah. visited in the sense that, um, yeah, there's lots of opportunity and lots of option. Um, and it's not, you know, we don't do the day to day where it's just, just all kind of hardcore all day. Um, we, we tend to take a break in the early afternoon, again, um, depending on whether it's winter or summer, but the summer days here are very long. And so mm. you're usually up early, but you know, the light gets kind of poor and things settle down pretty early. So you can take a break midday and kind of see, see the town or just relax or whatnot. And then we go out again when the activity and light gets good in the afternoon. Excellent forest. Um, Patricia is asking in the summer. What are the crowds like um, with all the visitors and campers and hikers? I mean, I guess some areas do get quite congested um, in the heart of the park. And she's just, you know, wondering, do we, do we tend to avoid those areas on our tours? Yes. Yeah. Short answer, yep. Um, and the, uh, <laughs> but there's, there's a couple of easy things that, um, I don't want to say this too loudly or broadcast it too widely, but there's a couple of little things that make the experience better even when you do have, say, a bear jam. Because... It's, it's hard and probably actually unwise to drive right past seeing like a sow grizzly bear with two cubs right next to the road. I mean, you want to kind of experience these things, but, yeah. but we tend to do it the safe way. We'll find a near pullout and then we'll find a viewing area where, you know, maybe you're not right next to them, like, like the lines of cars that kind of, kind of accumulate sometimes, but, uh, but you get to observe them at length and you can be away from the crowd. So we tend to, to kind of pick our spots and we have special like, certain viewpoints we, we kind of lean towards that are off, uh, off trail, but, but not far, where you can view the wolf dens or you can you know, view the meadows where the courting grizzly tend to go and mm -hmm. things like that. So um, a lot of it's pretty worked out. And when, when, the, you know, when the birds are concerned as well, um, we tend, tend to focus our bird efforts in uncongested areas as well. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, there's going to be a little traffic. There's going to be, you know, your bear jam. You're going to have a herd of a hundred bison coming down the road and there's nothing you can really do but wait but uh but all of that you know those things that create the congestion are part of the experience but um also part of the experience is feeling a bit removed and uh and we we do the best we can for that for sure fantastic yeah i i, th I think that's the beauty about going with somebody like yourself who just you know knows the park so intimately you know all of the, the little special spots um you know and that, and that makes it special and you can kind of remove yourself from those main congested zones and get out and about and have a have an amazing experience um be, because of that yeah um all right so from just purely from a birding point of view um allison wants to know what what's the absolute best time to visit yellowstone just you know if you want to focus on birds i, I would i would assume that i would assume the summer but maybe i'm 
maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, no, no. Summer's right. Yeah, it's um, it's certainly sort of, you know, last last week of May, first couple of weeks of June are probably best. Um, I would say if you wanted to pick like just a really finite window where you could just kind of get everything. It's not great. It's not a great time for owls. Um, but it's, uh, but it's, and it's coming to the end of the grouse. Like you're kind of done with sage grouse and sharp tail grouse, but you can still get rough and you still get dusky. Um, and, um, and probably sharp tail on the prairies, but you know, for some of those special species that people go for, you know, a little earlier in the year, um, you know, you can actually have a fairly decent chance of seeing things like boreal owls and great gray owls and those sorts of things if you come in what would be the off season, say March, April, October, September, these kinds of things. Um, but the best time of year to get, you know, that full prairie experience of long spurs flying around you and curlews displaying and all this, uh, as well as your alpine birds, black rosy finches and fields of flowers and stuff. Um, definitely, definitely summer, you know, kind of early in summer if you, if you want to get the grouse displaying, but if that's not a big thing, then, uh, then yeah, really any time up until late July, everything's just going all out. So, so it's really cool. Yeah, sounds special, very special. Uh, Linda's just asking, she says, uh, Pine Siskin in the San Francisco Bay area were hit with a deadly disease this winter. Did the ones in Yellowstone also, also have that? Not that you're aware no. of? No. no, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the movements of the finches would be from the west of the continental divide to the east. Um, because a lot of the movements here are actually more towards the east and boreal areas, kind of moving away from the higher part of the divide going down. I don't hmm. really know how much intermingling there is there would be with say pine siskins between here and in the Bay Area. But after hearing that, I'm hoping not much. But yeah, ours are ours are doing fine. Um, yeah, big numbers. Uh, don't even really have so many feeders around. So we, we don't even really get the, the conjunctivitis all that often and, and those sorts of things. So yeah, they're doing really well. Okay, good, good to hear. Um, and Mary wants to know as well, and um, I'm quite cute. Oh, well, little pine martins, they're, they're pretty cute, but she, Mary's just asking how, how large are they? Oh, uh, the pine martin? Yeah. Oh man, they're, well, a couple feet long. Okay. You know they're they're a big they're a big they're a pretty big weasel they're a pretty big fluffy weasel they can get a they can get they can get yeah what two two and a half feet long something like that yeah okay wow yeah 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 yeah, yeah. decent size <laughs> yeah um all right and then finally well we, we sort of kick off with the uh with the mythical and the wonderful but any any chances for for wolverine <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> I can't. I can't even add up the amount of hours I've spent on snowshoes and stuff looking for Wolverine. Um, I have never, I've seen Wolverine tracks. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> um, I think the number of people I know that have, that have actually seen a Wolverine and properly identified it, probably I, I think I can count on, on one hand. Um, they're just, they're really tough. And, and they were, they were doing research projects and they found a Wolverine den. So it's like, you know, you can do that, but, but, um, it happens on occasion. It's usually in the depths of winter, um, huh. maybe at a carcass, but, uh, but yeah, for the most part, you got to go out and try and track something that can move about, about 10 times faster than you can across the snow and it never gets cold or tired. So it's not easy to catch up with the Wolverine. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a, it sounds like awesome. a mythical, mythical creature. I would sure. love to see one. Yeah, it's, it's my number one, probably my number one mammal, actually. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. amazing. Absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. That's, uh, that's all we've got time for. Forrest, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, your expertise on, on Yellowstone and, and showcasing such a wonderful part of your world. Um, I, I certainly enjoyed that one very much. And I'll speak for Nikki here, but I'm, I'm sure... Uh, sure you enjoyed it a lot as well there's uh yeah plenty plenty to go out there and see and experience that's for sure uh, pretty memorable and then um yeah we're, we're really looking forward to a couple of weeks time um it's going to be the turn of, of daniel he's going to be joining us and we're going to go and visit uh visit west africa we're going to go and experience a little bit of uh, ghana and some of those beautiful west african forests and, and broadleaf woodlands out there so that's going to something to really enjoy and look forward to 
um, certainly a part of the world that I've had the pleasure of experiencing a number of times and it's a, a very, very special place. So yeah, thank you everyone for joining us once again on behalf of yeah, Forrest Nikki and myself. Um, goodbye, so we'll see you next time. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.